Jeff, what does your research say about the nature of time? This is a, perhaps the biggest question, one of the most profound questions, the nature of time. Uh, there are many different aspects that one has to consider. Um, you know, there's the, uh, the time that we experience as human beings. This has a certain quality to it. It has a direction to it. There's an arrow of time. So one might ask, what is the nature of that? Well, we don't really know. Is it related to the expansion of the universe, perhaps? Is it related to the thermodynamic arrow of time, the direction of entropy, so on and so forth? These things we really don't know. There's, there's much debate going on about it. However, if you ask about the nature of time at a microscopic level, when you're dealing with quantum mechanics, uh, what our group has discovered is a absolutely extraordinary uh, features, completely different from the way we experience time on a human level. So one thing uh, that particularly Aharonov had started was he noticed that one of the profound and fundamental differences between classical physics and quantum mechanics is that in quantum mechanics, as a matter of principle, at its very core, the nature of the boundary conditions in the theory is completely different from the boundary conditions in classical physics. So in classical physics, we know that if you know the state of the universe at one time, every other later time is not independent of that state. They're all completely slaved, in a sense, mm -hmm. because the theory is deterministic. You know the state at one point, it determines the state at every other point. In and time. we know the laws of physics. And we know the, suppose we know the laws of physics, right. we know the way things interact with each other, then there's uh, it's really just like a big machine. It's just a, a, a clockwork that there's no, you know, there's no freedom after you know the state of the universe at one point. However, in quantum mechanics, in principle, we cannot know more than what is the basic description, um, which is given by the wave function, even for a single particle. This sort of sense of the likeliness, likelihood of different properties of the particle. It's a probability. So it ends up being a probability, but the actual basic mathematical description is more, is, isn't even yet a probability. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the probability you can only define if you have many particles, you have a whole ensemble, and you right, do right, many, right, many right. experiments on it, and right. so on and so forth. So uh, it, it, it turns out that um, uh, the, even if you know everything that can be known about a a single particle, or for the universe for that matter, you cannot predict the future, like we could do in, in classical physics. So this allows one to say that um, the most basic description of a particle, of a quantum particle, allows you to say that you have two boundary conditions, the past of that particle and its future. So if you're asking what is the nature of the properties of the particle during the time between its past and its future, it turns out that the past and the future play an equal role, on an equal footing. And so now, when you're asking about the nature of time, as you can kind of see, this is totally different from what happens in classical physics. Um, and uh, uh, one picture that has been very fruitful in terms of making uh, a number of, of uh, very uh, important discoveries uh, in, in several different disciplines of physics has been the notion that um, yeah, when we describe a particle, um, we use the usual standard way of thinking about it in quantum mechanics, in which you have a state which evolves forward in time, and we use a second state which is specified by a just a standard experiment, just like we did in the past when we prepared the particle in some definite state that we knew. In the future, we do another experiment like that. And now we have another wave, which is actually going in the opposite arrow of time. And so if you're asking about the nature of the time on a quantum mechanical level, you have time going in both directions. And in a sense, the, the way the properties of the quantum world show up, you have to the uh, sort of kiss in the present, so to speak. And one has to, to devise all kinds of new ways of observing the quantum world to see how this, this shows up. So you're claiming that the uh, movement from the past to the present is equal to the movement from the future to the present? That's right. I mean, is that a mathematical formalism that you need, or is that something that you really have evidence for? Well, this 
there's two answers to this. First of all, uh, it, it's been proven that this way of expressing the theory is, in fact, equivalent in terms of the predictions it makes to the standard way, which is time asymmetric. So what this means is that, in fact, you cannot say for sure at this level whether the old way of looking at it, the time asymmetric way, is the correct way or this new way of looking at it. You can't say which one is the correct way. And so at this point, it becomes a question of, well, which approach is more useful? Which approach is more interesting? Does one approach allow you to discover all kinds of new physical phenomena? And it's certainly the case with this time symmetric approach that we have made many uh, new discoveries, uh, particularly concerning the nature of time, um, where you can distinguish the theories. There is a scenario whereby one could say that, in fact, this time symmetric approach is correct. And the old way of thinking about it, the standard quantum mechanics, time asymmetric approach, is incorrect. And those are situations that we call generalizations of quantum mechanics. These are situations where the new perspective, the new worldview, would lead to a new theory, which makes predictions which are inconsistent with the old theory. And then the experimentalists would go out and test to see if the, those predictions are correct. Or not. And the implications of this for this time symmetric, where the movement from past to future is the equivalent of future to past, what are the deep implications for the nature of reality? Well, if one's considering uh, generalizations of the theory, which can be proven experimentally uh, over the standard way of uh, understanding the quant of time in, in the quantum realm, I'll give you a couple of implications. For example, one uh, generalization which uh, we created of uh, the theory it hasn't been proven yet, uh, but it's very natural. Uh, uh, coming, it's very natural to, uh, to derive it um, based on uh, the kind of uh, where we started, is um, the following question. Um, you know, the, our view of the nature of time uh, came out from ancient, really, ancient times. Uh, Parmenides in particular, I believe, um, which he said the way we should think about the universe is that the universe uh, uh, you know, exists with objects, unique objects, which simply change their state and time. But it's the same object from one moment to the next, right? That's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just sort of, we've accepted this way of thinking about the universe. However, around the same time in, you know, the ancient Greeks, um, there was a very different way of thinking about the nature of time, which just, you know, didn't catch on. And this is uh, from Heraclides. And Heraclides, you know, not many of his words survived uh, the t all this time. One of them uh, goes something like this. He said, you never bathe twice in the same mm. river. And <clears throat> one way of interpreting that is that, um, in fact, each moment of time, it's not the same universe. It's not the same object as it was a second ago or a hundred years ago. But literally, each moment of time is like a new universe. Is it something completely new? It gets reborn again and again. And so one might ask, is it possible to reformulate our basic physics in a way that's consistent with that idea? And you can prove that it is impossible on a quantum level uh, to do it with the standard way, a time asymmetric way of thinking about quantum mechanics. A one direction. A one direction arrow of time. The only way you could do it, if you want to have such a picture, is to use the, the time symmetric approach, where the past uh, plays, uh, uh, the, well, the future plays as much a role in the present as, as the past. And so using that, an example of a generalization, we were able to reformulate the whole theory in such a way that quite literally, it's a very beautiful uh, mathematical theory, literally every moment is like recreating the universe again and again and again. It's a kind of a psychological illusion that we think that the self I was a fraction of a second ago is the same self I am now. But it works very well. You can just, the, the way it works is we, are, we have connections across time, so to speak. You know, we have, we're entangled with different moments. And this entanglement is what actually provides the, the continuity in, in the physics. That's just one example to show how uh, the nature of time can be profoundly different in this view and actually profoundly different from a quantum perspective when compared to a classical physics perspective.